first of all, thanks to uh, to all of you for uh, for showing up this Saturday morning, uh, and thanks so much again to Steve for uh, organizing the virtual uh, version of the the Greenway talk series. Um, it's something I, I really look forward to uh, doing every year. Um, kind of getting to uh, to talk to everyone about what we've been working on with the Hale Telescope, and uh, it's always great to hear the perspectives of of all the folks in the community who, are, who, who have an interest in the telescope as well. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking about how we've been using the Hale Telescope to observe the evolution of planets. Um, I'm primarily going to be talking about planets outside our solar system, exoplanets. Uh, but it has, the work that we're doing has implications for our understanding of the solar system as well. And I'll, I'll try to get into that too. Uh, so before I get into the talk, though, I, I also wanted to quickly thank everyone that um, has played a role in getting Palomar back up and running in kind of the safe operations mode that we're currently in. Um, so most of you probably know, but if you don't, um, the observatory did shut down for some time uh, due to COVID. And then um, there was a considerable amount of work in uh, getting it up and running in kind of a a reduced operations mode. And so um, every time I give one of these Greenway talks, I always like to, to uh, show a result that's in progress, just to, to give you all a sense of, of where our head's at. And uh, I think that's even more important now, just to, to show all of you that all the hard work that's been put in um, from the observing staff to the operations team at Caltech, um, all that work that's been put in is already paying off scientifically. And we've got some really, really cool stuff in the pipeline. So all that said, um, oh, and I should also say, feel free to like interrupt me. I'll, I'll try to monitor the chat window during the talk, but if I miss it, uh, feel, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, kind of center this talk on three big scientific questions. One, uh, what kinds of uh, planets are out there? Two, how do these planets evolve over time? And three, what are the ultimate fates of these planets? And I think, um, so, so, so my goal in this talk is to kind of give you an example of each of, of how we're able to address and kind of clarify each one of these questions with observations taken at the Hale Telescope. Um, but I think one of my goals is also to complicate these questions and in many cases entangle these questions with observations at the Hale Telescope. As well. So I've laid them out in kind of a discrete separated sense but in reality, all three of these questions are deeply intertwined. And, and I hope you get a sense for that uh, as I go throughout the talk. So I'm going to begin by talking about um, what kinds of planets are out there. So uh, up until 1990-ish, uh, this was our, our data set. This was our answer to that first question, uh, our solar system. Um, excluding, of course, the sun. Uh, this is the 20 largest bodies in the solar system, a really nice graphic that was put together. Um, and it's by no means a bad data set, right? We already see in the solar system, there's, there's quite a tremendous amount of diversity. We have gas giants, things like Jupiter and Saturn, enormous ring system in Saturn that, you know, I, I think, forget who said it, but the quote was, uh, if, if Saturn didn't have rings, you could never have dreamed of them or something like that. Um, we have the ice giants, we have planets with substantial atmospheres, and even moons with substantial atmospheres. We have moons with volcanism like Io, and we even have planets with life like Earth and, you know, who knows, other, maybe other planets and moons as well. Um, now, I should mention, uh, Eris was not known in 1990, but, uh, you know, excluding that slight anachronism, uh, you know, it's, it's a good data set, but as astronomers and planetary scientists, um, and, you know, even as, as just folks who are interested in, in space and knowing what's out there, uh, the question that we naturally ask is, is this it? You know, is, is this all the diversity that's to be expected of planets in the universe? Are there even other planets out there? 
you know, folks um, on the science fiction side and really for as long as humans have been around, we've been thinking, about, are there other, uh, other folks looking at stars like our sun and thinking about whether we exist? Um, you know, I think there was a, a talk to this effect earlier in the, in the Greenway series. So I won't go too deep uh, along that rabbit hole. But, you know, the question, is this it, is, is a pretty deep question. Um, and since 1990, it's a question that we've been able to definitively answer. The answer is absolutely not. This is not it. Um, over the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen kind of an explosion of, uh, of extrasolar planets, planets discovered around systems or around stars that are not our sun. Uh, and I'll go into some of the techniques for uh, detecting exoplanets in a bit. But in this plot, which uh, gets populated over time, you see that it's filling up and up and up with planets that don't really resemble anything in our solar system. What's being shown here is the planetary mass as a function of its orbital period, um, with our Earth being, you know, 365 days, um, orbital period, for instance, and uh, yeah. masses are in Jupiter masses. Oh, was there a question? No? Okay. Uh, so, so clearly, um, there are a ton of planets, and this plot actually doesn't give you the whole picture. It only gives you a picture of the planets whose masses have been measured. Uh, in reality, there's about 4,000 plus exoplanets that have been discovered. Um, and, and I'll actually go into a bit of why that mass, the question of planetary masses. Is but um, certainly the answer to the question, um, is this it, in terms of... Uh, the diversity of the solar system uh, is, is absolutely not. There are an enormous number of planets out there, the likes of which uh, we've, we've never really seen before. And I think uh, another thing that's useful to look at on this plot is uh, detection biases. So um, without even knowing anything about the radial velocity or transit technique or anything like that, you can kind of see that the planets that we're detecting are, are massive. Um, so these big transiting planets over here, um, and um, many of them are close in. In fact, most of the planets that we've detected are, are close in. Um, this clump over here is really quite dense. So the majority of the planets that we've detected on that plot come from the transit technique. And transits happen when you combine the powers of geometry and luck. So, you know, by, by luck, I mean, you have to get lucky to see a transit. A planetary orbit has to be aligned exactly with your line of sight to a star, such that um, if you look at that star for long enough, every so often, you'll see a planet pass in front of the star and block out a little bit of that star's light. And this is an incredibly powerful technique, because if a larger planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out proportionally more light from the star, which means that by measuring the light curve of the star, the brightness of the star over time, we can get a sense, um, if we see planets transit, we can get a sense for how big those planets are. Um, of course, the, the, the spacecraft that has contributed so far most to our understanding of planets uh, was the Kepler mission, rest in peace, um, which, was, which used this transit technique to detect thousands of planets orbiting stars other than our sun. And uh, currently the TESS mission is continuing uh, this amazing legacy that, that Kepler left off. So in terms of thinking about the diversity of planets, um, I kind of want to talk about the biggest takeaway from the Kepler mission. What I think the biggest takeaway is, um, sure it's arguable, but this is a pretty big one. And it comes from this plot uh, from B.J. Fulton uh, and collaborators in 2018. So what's being shown here is the frequency of planets around a star. So if you were to pick a random star, you know, uh, how many planets would you expect in a certain size range around that star? Um, and these are all short period planets with orbital periods shorter than 100 days. 
Um, and plotted for reference are the, the size of the Earth, the size of Neptune, and the size of Jupiter. Now, all these planets orbit outside of 100 day, days, but they're plotted here for reference. Now, what is this plot, plot showing us? Oh, and I should mention, it's, it's all corrected very carefully for detection biases of the Kepler spacecraft. Now, what is this plot showing us? It shows us that really the most common type of planet in the galaxy within uh, about a 100 day orbital period is unlike anything we have in our own solar system. There are planets that are larger than Earth and smaller than Neptune that really make up the bulk of, of exoplanets that we see. And um, even then you can kind of make out that there are uh, sort of two distinct classes, right? It's not just one peak of, uh, of, of these planets, but there are uh, planets that are slightly bigger than Earth, which are called super-Earths, and planets that are slightly smaller than Neptune, called sub-Neptunes. And those two classes of planets appear fairly distinct in this uh, distribution of planet frequency. And now, one of these things that, uh, oh, sorry, I think I just lost my cursor here. Uh, let's see, there we go. So one of these things that I think um, is, is, uh, entangles the questions that I was talking about at the beginning um, is, is that the observed distribution of planets in that plot, those super-Earths and sub-Neptunes, actually depends on how planets evolve over time. So those two questions are not are, are, are kind of inextricable from each other. They're, they're, not, they're, they're completely entangled. And the picture for that, how this happens is as follows. Uh, to build up a planet, you, you start by assembling uh, a sort of rocky core. Um, basically, you have dust, and the dust uh, coagulates and hits each other. And in certain cases, there are fluid instabilities uh, in the nebula that where planets are born that helps this process along. But by some process, you go from little dust grains to a big ball of rock. And on top of that rock, you can add gas from the parent nebula in which these planets are born. Um, and so we expect very young planets to have kind of a more or less continuous distribution of uh, core sizes and gas fractions. But remember, all of these planets orbit quite close to their host stars. They orbit within about 100 days. And so gas isn't the only ingredient in this equation. There's also heat to consider. Now, what can heat do? Heat can cause that low density gas in the upper atmosphere to escape the gravitational potential of the planet. And what that means is that planets with massive rocky cores um, have enough gravitational potential to hold on to some of their gas, and planets whose cores aren't that massive can't hold on to that gas. And so the population will bifurcate. You'll end up with a class of mini Neptunes that you expect to be slightly smaller than Neptune, um, which largely are able to hold on to that low density gas and you end up with a population of super-Earths, which are primarily rocky bodies that maybe retained a tiny bit of gas, but not too much more than that. And so um, this, is, this is the theory for how you, you get that sort of bimodal distribution of planet radii. Um, how do we test it? How do we, how do we go in and test that theory? Well, one way you could do so is by measuring the masses of these planets. Remember, we already know their radii, so if we know their masses, we can get their densities. And if there's a lot of hydrogen and helium in these, uh, these mini Neptunes, then we expect their densities to be lower than the super-Earth densities. And again, this is something that we can test. So you might have heard already of one way to test this theory with measuring masses. And, and that technique uh, used to measure planetary masses is the radial velocity technique. So um, here, what, what you're uh, looking at is you're taking the light from the host star of the planet, you're breaking it up as a function of wavelength, and you're watching how spectral lines in that, in that star spectrum uh, shift over time. Now, assuming that those shifts emerge from the Doppler effect, uh, you can interpret this as a radial speed of the star moving back and forth at something like a few meters per second. And 
when you measure that radial velocity curve, that means you can work backwards and figure out what the mass of the planet must be that's you know, causing these radial velocity variations in the host star. And so by measuring the stellar spectrum um, for bright stars where we have a lot of photons um, and for massive planets where this, this signal is biggest, um, we can uh, in effect deduce the density of, of uh, many of these sub-Neptunes and, and supernovas. But remember, um, detection techniques tend to be biased towards massive planets. And these super-Earths and sub-Neptunes aren't really all that massive. And so it would be really nice to have another way to measure planetary masses that isn't so sensitive to mass. Um, and the way to do this is a technique called transit timing variations. So let me see if this video will play. Uh, yeah, there we go. So to think about transit timing variations, we have to think about what it means uh, to transit in a multi-planet system. So in a single planet system, uh, planets orbit according to Kepler's laws, right? Which means that that time of transit, um, if you just time the middle of the transit right there, um, will happen you know, at a constant periodicity, uh, kind of like clockwork. And every orbit, um, it will happen kind of on the same clock. But if you add another planet into the mix, um, and especially if you add another planet near uh, a, what's called an orbital resonance, where the planetary orbital periods are near integer ratios of each other, um, that clock can change substantially because the planets are tugging on each, each other and those tugs can become coherent. And so sometimes when you measure that planet's transit, it'll come early. And sometimes when you measure that planet's transit, it will come late and early and late and early and late. And that sort of sinusoidal variation is related to the masses in the system, right? Because, because the transit times are deviating from constant periodicity due to the gravitational effect between the planets, we can measure the transit times and work backwards to infer the planet masses. I know, I know that's a, it's a bit of a, a convoluted uh, explanation. So does anyone have any, any questions about that uh, before I, I move to the next slide? So this is good for systems with multiple planets. And how many systems do we know of that have multiple planets? Yeah, great question. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact number. Um, but you can do TTVs in um, of order 100 systems, maybe a few more, uh, maybe a few less. Um, I think the biggest survey that I remember is like constraints on 150-ish planets. Um, so it, it should be noted, like multi-planet systems are necessary for this, but not sufficient. You need them to also have planets that are close to these orbital resonances near, near integer ratios of each other's orbital periods. Uh, let's see. So I have a question in the chat here. So if a planet that is being observed has varying transit times, do astronomers infer or probe further investigation for a planet interfering with the first planet's orbital period? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go into this a bit uh, deeper through the talk, but uh, in general, the answer is yes. Uh, we, I mean, we always want more data. So the more points that we can get on that timing curve, the better it is. Um, but usually if a planet's uh, transit times are varying, something interesting is happening. Uh, what that something interesting is depends a lot about the characteristics of the system. Um, and in this talk, I'll show you a different version of transit timing variations that doesn't have to do with the existence of another planet at all. Um, so stay tuned for that. Great, great questions. So uh, now, uh-oh, uh, now the connection that I wanna make with the Hale telescope is that we, um, using the Hale telescope, can measure transit timing variations. And we do so um, using this instrument called the Wide Field Infrared Camera, or WORK. Um, now on the left is, is a picture of WORK, I believe, uh, installed at the prime focus cage. Um, and uh, I, I took this straight off Dimitri Malway's website. Um, uh, he's also someone that we collaborate with quite a bit. And uh, on the right is a sample image taken with WORK in imaging mode. So work is, is, is not so different than the telescopes that you might have at home or you know, some of the observations that you might carry out with uh, 
with the telescope on your own. We're, we're really just doing imaging. Um, we're just taking pictures of the sky, we're looking at stars, and uh, we're measuring how bright those stars are over time, right? The only difference is that we're doing so in a really, really precise way. And there are certain aspects of the Hale telescope that help us out tremendously with that. Um, certain optics that we put in work um, allow us to track brightness variations very carefully, um, as, do the, uh, as does the exceptional guiding of the Hale telescope, which guides extremely precisely. Um, and also, you know, having a huge mirror to help you collect all those photons is, is the biggest thing that, that helps us out. Um, but all that to say, we can make these transit timing variation measurements at Palomar Observatory. Um, and, and that's on its own, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, but a related question might be, you know, why would we even want to do so, right? Because that Kepler telescope that you heard so much about, you know, this is, is the, uh, an incredibly precise instrument for measuring transits. Um, so, like, why would we want to, to jump in on this game, you know, 10 years after Kepler launched and, and try to do the same thing? Well, the reason is as follows. In this plot, I'm showing the transit timing variations, the, the deviations from perfect periodicity for the planet Kepler 29b. Uh, and in black are plotted the times of transit measured by Kepler, or rather the TTVs measured by Kepler. And you can see already that they're deviating from periodicity in this beautiful kind of like sinusoidal pattern. But uh, what I've also plotted here, uh, and these TTVs are as a function of observing epoch in BJD, by the way. So like zero is like 2009, uh, which is the start of the Kepler mission in, in this reference frame. So what I've also plotted here um, are various models for the masses of the planets in the system. I think the blue curves are high mass solutions, the red curves are low mass solutions, and the green curves are like medium mass solutions, for instance. But the point that I want to draw your attention to is that in the range of the Kepler data, all of these models fit the data pretty well. But as you go further and further away from Kepler, these solutions begin to diverge. And so wouldn't it be really great to drop a measurement right there, 10 years after the Kepler mission, 15 years after the Kepler mission, um, where you can begin to differentiate between the mass solutions. Um, and in doing so, you can constrain planetary masses quite precisely with a minimal investment of observation time. Uh, and so that's, that's exactly what we did. We actually went in and measured the Kepler-29 system. Um, and these are both sub-Neptune sized planets with small hydrogen envelopes. And uh, what we were able to do is with a single night of observations, you know, six, seven, eight hours of time, that's it. We were able to measure the mass of uh, these sub-Neptune planets in some cases by a factor of three better than Kepler was able to do alone with just one night on Palomar. Um, and you know, even compared to facilities um, like Keck, which does a, a ton of radial velocity work that's really amazing, because this star is so faint, it's really hard to make that measurement um, because you just don't have a ton of photons to measure the spectrum with. Um, and so this is really a powerful way to measure planetary masses, especially in faint systems. Um, and it's something that Palomar is, is quite well suited to. Now, we also measured the mass and radius of the planet Kepler-177c, uh, or rather determined them more precisely. In most of these cases, we're, we're refining masses and radii and not determining them for the first time. So here, what I'm showing you is the transit light curve of Kepler-177c. Again, uh, it's normalized so that the, the star on its own is a brightness of one, um, and then the planet blocks out a fraction of that light, so it's relative brightness. And here, we're just seeing the start of the transit. Uh, what we call it ingress. Um, now, why didn't we observe the whole thing? Well, it turns out on the Earth, uh, the sun does rise eventually, and so that's our hard limit on how long we can observe transits. Um, but we have a good idea of how long the transit is from Kepler anyway, so that's not too big of a problem. Now, this planet is extremely interesting because it is the size of Saturn, but it is only 15% of Saturn's mass. Now remember, if you had a bathtub that could theoretically fit Saturn uh, and not, you know, self-gravitate and collapse immediately, uh, 
this bathtub, in this bathtub, Saturn would float um, if it was floating on water. This planet is 15% uh, of the mass of Saturn. And so what this means is that this is one of the puffiest planets yet discovered. Um, so puffy that the, the technical term for it currently is a super puff. Um, if you've come to some of the Greenway talks that I've done before, you might have heard me mention this term before uh, as well. Um, but I think super puffs are, are really interesting and cool addition to the story because they don't exactly fit into the picture of, uh, of planet formation as I've, uh, as I've laid it out here. So remember the sub-Neptune's um, picture is you start out with a rocky core, you add some gas, and it's massive enough to hold on to that gas. Or uh, when we see super Earths, um, they lose that gas because they're not massive enough. Um, a sort of uh, related population that I didn't really talk about was gas giants. Um, and for gas giants, you, you need to build a huge rocky core of about 10 Earth masses rather rapidly. Um, and once you pass that 10 Earth mass threshold, you trigger a process that's called runaway accretion, basically an instability where you can get more and more and more and more gas. Um, and that's how you end up with something that looks like Jupiter. But these, oops, sorry, these super puffs don't really fit into the picture. They have cores that are something similar to what sub-Neptunes and super Earths have, but they have gas fractions that are, look way more like gas giants. And so um, something isn't exactly right here. And, and there's definitely a lot of room for investigation. Um, and Palomar can help us, help us make those investigations for sure. So um, at the end of the day, um, when we think about what kinds of planets are out there, in fact, there are entire classes of planets that we're just now learning about. And Palomar is, has been really instrumental for helping us learn um, about these sub-Neptunes, these super-Earths, these super-Puffs, and whatever else we may find uh, in the near future. So before I move on to the next part, um, how do planets evolve over time, I wanted to check in again quickly and see if we have any questions. I don't know, I can't talk for like an hour uninterrupted, so like I need someone to ask something. <laughs> Is there an advantage to doing this work in the infrared, or is it specifically features of work that you're relying on? Fantastic question. Um, observing in the infrared hurts us for TTVs. Why does it hurt us? Um, because the infrared has worse background qualities, like the, like the sky background is worse in the infrared, but the signal doesn't change, right? The planet blocks out approximately as much light as it does um, in the infrared as it does in the, uh, as in the optical. So um, in many cases, the infrared does actively hurt us. Um, we, the reason that we're using uh, this instrument in the infrared is we're able to make a more diverse range of measurements. Um, and that's actually one of the uh, motivations for this next project that I'm gonna show you. Um, but I should mention it does have some Mr. advantages. Off, I appreciate it. You're making it very hard for me to get out Thank you. Yeah, no so that another car can't get in, I won't hit the motorcycles on the way out. What is going on over there? <laughs> All right. Um, so, so I should mention there are um, there are advantages. So, uh, if we observe M dwarf systems, stellar activity is a little better uh, in the infrared than in the optical. So. Um, that will help us out a little bit when making transit timing observations. Um, but in general, uh, if you have an optical telescope that has all the same properties of Palomar, uh, or if you have an optical instrument that has all the same properties as work, rather, because of course Palomar can observe in the optical, um, with all the same optics, which is really important. One of the optical components that we have in work is, is really key to making this all happen. Um, you could get better precision. Great question. Thanks. Anything else? Treas, how, um, you know, Jupiter orbits at, uh, like there's one orbit every 12 years, I guess. <clears throat> if you're using the transit method, you're gonna be waiting a long time to uh, get confirming transits. Uh, how, how do we, do we, are there ways to detect um, 
exoplanets that are that far out from their hosts? Yeah, another great question. Um, this speaks to one of the biases of the transit technique that I was, uh, I was kind of alluding to in one of the earlier plots. Um, of course, planets on short orbits are a lot easier to detect, right? Both geometrically, because uh, you, can, you can kind of get lucky a lot easier because they're closer to their host stars. Um, but also in terms of just observing baseline, right? Just like you said, um, even you don't even have to go out to Jupiter, like even the Earth, a one-year orbital period, you, you, it's, it's hard to confirm transits with like two or three observations. Kepler lasted for about four years, so it, it's, it's really hard to do that. Um, but there's kind of two ways you can think about it. Um, one is, you know, you can, you can observe a lot of stars, um, for a long time and increase your odds that way. Um, you can also switch techniques, right? Um, so you can go to the radial velocity technique where um, instruments are getting more and more precise. They don't really, ha you don't have to get lucky in the same way as you do in transits. Um, and you can measure the masses of planets that are non-transiting. Um, or you can even do something like astrometry, which uh, Gaia is gonna enable very, very soon for us uh, in the coming years. Um, it's probably gonna, detect quite a few planets at very uh, long orbital separations. But actually already the radial velocity technique is delivering a lot of planets that are a lot colder um, than the planets that the transit technique probes. Uh, so different techniques have their different niches. Good, thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, I'm gonna move on to um, how do these planets evolve over time? You know, and before I start talking about, um, you know, exoplanets and stuff, we, we have been interested in planetary evolution uh, for, for quite some time uh, because we've known about planets for as long as we've been living on one. Um, and in planetary science, especially, we're, we're still interested in um, what happened before now. We live in a snapshot in cosmic time, but we'd like to know how these planets were born. You know, what they were like a gig a year ago, what they're going to be like billions of years from now. And so there are a couple of classic time machines, I like to call them, in planetary science that allow us to go backwards in time or forwards in time and understand what planets are doing not at this exact snapshot in time. One of them is planetary geology. So looking at surface features on planets, um, you know, fluvial features, for instance, will allow us to infer the presence of past uh, liquid on, on planetary surfaces, um, sometimes water, sometimes things like methane, ethane. Meteoritics, meteorites are an extremely pristine record of the composition, the, the, the very earliest composition of the solar system uh, before even the majority of planets had even uh, begun forming. Theoretical simulations, they can not only uh, you know, tell us uh, how planets formed and evolved dynamically, but they can also give us a, a look into the future, uh, which I'm going to address in a little bit. Oops. And um, they, they can tell us what's going to happen in a gig year. And there is this other one that I really like, uh, that is isotope ratios. So uh, when, when I'm talking about isotopes, it's basically like how many, uh, how many neutrons are in the atom that are uh, different, you, you know, it, it can make the, the atom heavier. <clears throat> so uh, a really important one of these isotopes to think about is argon. So argon on the earth is primarily argon 40. Uh, it's for, it has, an, uh, has a mass of 40 atomic mass units. But this picture that shows, you know, the argon fraction is almost like 99% argon 40 is kind of misleading. Because in the sun, um, as I think determined by meteorites, um, and also you know, throughout the universe, as we can determine um, by measurement of very rare argon hydrides, um, argon is actually primarily found as argon-36. Um, that, that isotope is actually much more abundant throughout the universe because it's produced um, very readily uh, in stars. So why do we see so much argon-40 in the Earth's atmosphere? Well, the reason is that atmospheres evolve, right? That argon-36 is, is what, would, what we'd call primordial argon, the argon that the Earth would, would have formed with 
but argon-40 actually comes from the radioactive decay of potassium-40, which is found in rocks on the Earth. And so that isotopic signature, argon-40 being very, very prevalent, is, is both a, a marker in some sense of atmospheric evolution, like the atmosphere is changing in time, it's, it's losing argon-36, but it's gaining argon-40, and it's also uh, sort of a marker of surface atmosphere interactions. So the isotope ratios are, are really, really cool. Um, and a planet for which they've been particularly important for interpreting observations is Venus. Um, and in fact, isotope ratios have been a, a key tool in suggesting that Venus uh, once may have had a, an ocean just like the Earth's that was lost and that the, uh, the hydrogen and oxygen from that water um, that was you know, split maybe by photo dissociation, that those atoms were blown off in an atmospheric wind. Now, if you remember earlier in the talk, I, I mentioned that heating and atmospheric evolution, atmospheric escape, is one of the key processes that shapes exoplanets because they're all so close to their host star. So if we're looking for a laboratory where we can test things like, uh, like the Venus's atmospheric escape, what better place to look than an exoplanet that's you know, being constantly blasted with radiation um, and is, is often, often these planets are currently losing atmosphere. So how do we evolve at, or how do we observe atmospheric escape from an exoplanet? Well, one way to do so is uh, by a technique called transit spectroscopy. So typically in the transit technique, light from the star um, might get blocked uh, by the planet or it might pass through uh, unimpeded and sort of the fraction of these rays that get blocked versus the fraction of the rays that pass through, that's what we observe in the, in the transit light curve. But in reality, this isn't the whole picture, right? Um, if a planet's atmosphere is, is, is escaping, if it's evolving, um, the outer layers of the atmosphere are, are actually expanding uh, and that there's, there's a very thin, very tenuous layer of gas that's constantly escaping that planet's atmosphere. Now, when we look at you know, normal wavelengths, we're not really sensitive to that gas. But if we choose a wavelength where that gas becomes opaque, then suddenly the planet begins to block out much more light from that host star. And consequently, the planet will appear much larger to us. So just to drive that home a little bit, you know, if we, if we look at this blue planet transiting this, uh, this yellow star in a relatively unexciting uh, wavelength, we might see a transit light curve that looks like this, where you only block out like a percent of the light. But if you pick a wavelength uh, where that high uh, altitude, low density gas uh, becomes, uh, becomes opaque, you'll see a much bigger transit. Now, these are just models. Um, and, and I should mention before I move on that um, we have developed a way to do this at Palomar Observatory. Um, well, uh, let me just move on, actually. So, so the way that we do it is we, is we tune our telescope to a wavelength that is uh, sensitive to that low-density outflowing gas um, that it actually probes the transition of helium. And uh, this is the same plot as you just saw just for a real system called WASP-69b. So in blue is the, uh, the measurement of the, the transit at optical wavelengths. Um, well, uh, from the literature, uh, the transit depth, you know, how much of that starlight it blocks out is um, shallower than 2%. It's well, well constrained, well studied planet. But when we measured it, our data are in gray, um, our, uh, our binned data are in black and our best fit models in red, we see a transit that's substantially deeper than 2%. Um, and it's deeper at very high confidence. Um, our uncertainties on this measurement are, are quite good. And so what we've done with this measurement is that we've confirmed that the atmosphere of WASP-69b is expanding, it's escaping. Um, the same process that we expect would have been active on Venus, you know, billions of years ago, we're observing in real time with the Hill telescope uh, right now, which, which I think is, is honestly like remarkable. Uh, so uh, I should mention uh, 
the system that we've come up with to do this measurement at Palomar is is really um, is really precise. Like like this isn't just like a like a one off measurement. This is um, at, a, at a precision that is competitive with the best high resolution spectrographs in the world, um, like the ones at Keck. Um, it's competitive, uh, and in fact, I think it it, it handily outperforms that of the Hubble Space Telescope, though of course HST isn't optimized to make this measurement. This is maybe an unfair fight, but uh, you know, this is really one of the most precise machines in the world for measuring atmospheric escape right now. Um, and yeah, wouldn't, I think, it, oh, sorry, was there, a, was there a question? Yeah, wouldn't the time of the transit change too? As, as, I mean, it looks like the time of the transit shown in the data doesn't change, but if the if you're looking at a bigger, if you're looking at the whole gas uh, atmosphere, wouldn't the time change too? Yeah, great question. Um, I think what you're getting at is the duration. Um, and indeed, you're correct. If you look at the blue model and the red model, um, if you look at how far they go uh, before they go back to one, um, you expect the red model to uh, to last that that transit to last a tiny bit longer than that blue model does. Uh -huh. um, it's it's really hard to tell in this data, but I mean, it does. We we do actually think we see that effect. Perhaps okay. more interesting is uh, there are hints, not in this data set, but in other data sets, that um, this gas is asymmetric. Um, that even though the planet, you know, planets are basically circles on the sky, right? But that expanding gas can can form like sort of a comet like tail and that substantially changes the shape of the transit um, and so that can be seen in, in certain circumstances in certain wavelengths yeah any other questions i think this is the last slide i've got on the atmospheric escape so so feel free to go <clears throat> No more? Okay, so I'll just say, um, you know, the, the spectrographs are better suited to make this measurement in that they can resolve the velocity profiles of the outflow. Like here, we're only making this measurement photometrically. So we can't actually tell like, you know, what gas is moving at what speed, which is something that a spectrograph is quite good at telling. Um, but for planets orbiting faint stars, where you really need super high um, throughput and super high efficiency to get as many photons as possible to even have a chance of making this measurement, um, that's where Palomar is excelling right now. Great, so revisiting our three questions. <clears throat> what kind of planets are out there? How do they evolve over time? Now I wanna move on to what are their ultimate fates? And again, as, as you might've guessed, the sort of theme throughout this, uh, throughout this talk is timing. Um, and there's a way to sort of probe how planets evolve over time um, that connects to what their ultimate fates are. So what's actually happening to these planets that are, that are really, really, really close to their host stars? Well, um, they're losing atmosphere, uh, they're losing mass, but they're also interacting with their host stars, whether um, that's, that's magnetically, you know, you have magnetic fields and solar winds and all that stuff gets, all, all those uh, effects get kind of amplified when you get close to the host star. Um, and there's also a tidal interaction between the planetary orbit and the star. Um, and in fact, uh, once you get quite close to the host star, you can begin to dissipate uh, quite rapidly energy from the planetary orbit into the star. <clears throat> And so depending on how dissipative the star is, you can actually cause the planet to lose orbital angular momentum and spiral in um, and sort of a death spiral towards the star. Um, and you might be thinking, uh, you know, if, if close in planetary orbits can decay due to tides, then these transit times and these eclipse times, eclipses uh, or occultations or whatever you want to call them are when for an exoplanet observer, it's when the planet goes behind the star, which also causes a signal that's a little smaller. Um, but the, they should change as a result as well. And, and really the first indication that work was a good instrument for doing this um, came 
in this 2019 paper by, by Sam Yi that I was very um, fortunate to be a part of. Um, and in this paper, they took um, <clears throat> more than 10 years of data on this one planet, WASP-12b, that's been monitored for a really long time. And they looked at the times of transits, and they looked at the times of occultations, and how they deviate from constant periodicity. Right? This is the same measurement as the transit timing variations that I was talking about before. But here, there are no other planets in the system that we know of that could be causing this effect. Yet, we still see that the tra transit times are evolving. <clears throat> What's that telling us? Well, here we've plotted two different models. It turns out that the orbital decay model is actually favored, and that's what Sam's paper is all about. Um, but what I want to point out is that this measurement in teal on this eclipse measurement of WASP-12b was made by work. Um, we actually contributed to this very large data set, and uh, the points next to it, all those uh, black squares, were made by the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and you can see that their error bars are approximately, you know, similar. So we're making measurements that are incredibly precise, so precise that um, if we make enough of them and if we combine with other telescopes that are similarly precise, we can begin to watch planets um, evolve at the end of their lifetimes, sort of spiral in towards their host stars to eventually, uh, to eventually be engulfed. And this, um, this sort of new, interesting kind of observation um, inspired uh, a project that is currently in progress that I want to talk a little bit about, um, about observing the tidal decay of a hot Jupiter planet around a subgiant star. So this, uh, this planet's called Kepler-1658. Um, the fun fact is actually the, the first planet that Kepler discovered that wasn't already known. Um, but it was classified as a false positive for a really long time, and it wasn't until 2019 until it was kind of rescued from that designation and shown to be an actual planet. Um, but here, um, the same thing as the last plot is shown. We're showing deviations from a constant periodicity as a function of time, um, and all of the gray points are Kepler transits, and uh, the black points are uh, binned Kepler transits to, to sort of increase the signal to noise. And what's seen is that the times of transits don't really change over the Kepler baseline. Uh, you know, not, not a particularly exciting result at first glance, but it is exciting because it's been suggested that stars become much more dissipative. Um, they, they're able to dissipate much more of that orbital angular momentum uh, as, uh, as they evolve off the main sequence. So this host star is a subgiant star. And you know, this, this red dashed line, if it, was, if it was really, really dissipative, we would expect that transit, those transit timings to follow those red dashed line. Now, it, clearly the data rule that out right now. Um, but if you were to follow some of these other models, um, even this uh, purple dash model, which is still fairly dissipative, um, you can't really get a good handle on it. So let me see if I can pull this up here. Yeah. So if you were to extend that purple model out, um, past, way past the Kepler baseline, out to where we are now, and if you were to uh, extend this black model, this uh, sort of non-dissipative model, out to where we are now, the, cha the uh, change in transit time for the non-dissipative model versus the change in transit time for the very dissipative model amounts to about a 30-minute difference. Um, as of like a week ago. And um, I think this is a really interesting point to note because if we can con constrain this observationally, right? If we can show that stars, uh, if, if we can show that planets orbiting subgiant stars are on death spirals, then that would kind of imply that the earth only has a few giga years left. Um, it's, it's projected that when the sun kind of uh, enters its red giant branch, it's going to get pretty big, but it won't immediately just swallow up the Earth's orbit. It won't get that big. But the problem is, if, it's, if, if as it gets bigger, it's able to cause the Earth to spiral in towards it, then it becomes a problem for the Earth. And, you know, the Earth is able to spiral in and, and eventually be engulfed by its host star on a much quicker time scale um, than other calculations would suggest. 
So we have kind of an interest in observing the system from a solar system perspective and uh, in fact, a terrestrial uh, perspective as well. So last week um, in a complete revert, uh, remote operations mode, we were able to point the Hale telescope towards Kepler 1658 and observe a transit. And uh, a very, very early result is, is, is shown here. This is what we saw. I have removed the time axis from this plot just so that um, no one kind of gets the wrong idea from it um, because it's, it's certainly not um, fully processed yet. But I just kind of wanted to give you all a sense of, of what we're dealing with here. Um, you can see that the transit's kind of noisy. Um, and in fact, the noise is kind of correlated. Like you can see it has up and down wiggles. Um, and that's actually expected because the star is a subgiant. Um, it, and it has actually detected oscillations as well. So some combination of like oscillations, maybe granulation on the stellar surface, and um, maybe something going on in the atmosphere as well is, is causing this. But nevertheless, we see the transit. And so we can time it. And where we, when we time it, we're able to put it on that last plot. And in putting it on that last plot, we can tell exactly how dissipative that star is. Um, and if we extend that logic to our own solar system, uh, we'll be able to tell, you know, if the Earth is gonna gonna stay alive as the sun evolves off the main sequence, or if it's if it's gonna spiral in, uh, which I think is is a really cool extension of this work. So, going back to these three questions, what kinds of planets are out there? Um, way more than we could have ever expected. How do they evolve over time? Well one of the easiest to observe ways that they evolve over time is atmospheric evolution. Of course, there's way more that happens. There's, you know, weather that happens on much shorter time scales and all these things, but I just talked about one way in this, in this work that we can actually observe with the Hale telescope. And what are their ultimate fates? Well, the closest in planets might spiral in towards their host, host stars, and that might be their ultimate fate. Um, and that would have implications for the solar system as well. So um, I hope that gives you all a bit, a bit to chew on. Uh, you know, I think exoplanets are a really amazing new field, but remembering the solar system and remembering uh, what it teaches, is about, teaches us about planets as places, as, as objects, and, and not just as data points is really crucial. Um, and it really, for me, it's informed the way that I think about exoplanets. And uh, I hope that the sort of synergy that I've, I've laid out in this talk um, uh, gives you an interesting perspective on this field of study as well. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. I think we're stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was like a good silence or a bad silence kind of thing. You know? <laughs> it's a good silence. No, that was, that was awesome. Um, I have a set of a question. You're talking about uh, cores that accumulate, rocky cores, and sometimes they, they accumulate gas and become like Jupiter, mm -hmm. but other times they just stay like rocky. And I was looking up the radius of the Earth and the radius of the cores of Jupiter and Saturn. And like, and I don't know how accurate the, the numbers are, but it's just numbers I was looking at. The Earth is like something like 6,400 kilometer radius and, and Jupiter is like seven kilometers rocky core. And then on top of that is all the other, the other stuff. So, so what, why, it doesn't seem that dramatic and yet Jupiter is enormous. Seven, you said seven kilometers? Yeah, seven thousand kilometers, sorry. Oh, seven thousand kilometers. Sorry, I was oh, like, that, that, seems, that seems a little small sorry. to me. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no worries. So um, I think, so part of the trouble actually with, uh, with Jupiter specifically is that um, the question of whether it has a defined core is still kind of open. Oh, okay. Um, it's something that, that the Juno mission is, is currently uh, determining right now um, using, for instance, uh, gravity data, uh, kind of telling what, trying to figure out exactly what the gravitational field around Jupiter is um, mm -hmm. and using the, those harmonics to model the interior structure of Jupiter. Okay. Um, that said, 
there, there are a couple of like considerations. So one is that the pressure at the interior of, of, of Jupiter's is quite a bit higher uh, because there's so much stuff that's like pushing down on all that material um, that you might expect will, would change the radius. Uh, I don't have the quantitative figure off the top of my head. And again, like because of the diffuseness <laughs> of the core, it's, it's a bit hard to say. Um, but there, there is that consideration as, as well. <coughs> Yeah, it, it's probably an old textbook anyway, so I, I can, I'm sure of that. So the numbers are probably not that precise anyway. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. The, I should say the the sort of like hard um, boundary is that we're, we're pretty sure to get something like Jupiter in the first place, you have to have at least 10 Earth masses of solid material. Mm. Um, so uh, if okay. you think about it in the mass kind of regime, uh, that's kind of the the order of magnitude that you're aiming for. Obviously, Earth is one Earth mass of material. In in uh, in, in that mass, ten Earth masses could be not just rock; it could be anything, or or is it per preferentially rock? You would have some gas as well, but uh, yeah, usually you form the core first, and then you then you grab gas from the disk on top it. of that. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, Thank and. You. Actually, it's, it's interesting because it sets a, a time scale for the formation of giant planets as well, because you have to grab all of that gas, all that you know, enormous amount of gas, before all the gas from the disk uh, in which these planets form has dissipated. So you know gas giants have to form really fast because of this process, uh, you know, five mm. to 10 million years max. Mm. When you measured the transit differences at different wavelengths, I'm thinking you used a tuned filter rather than an actual integral field spectrograph. You're thinking correctly. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what we used. Okay, so, and I've heard about this before, and you know, we amateurs, you know, we're herd type people. We buy O3 filters for our telescopes, and you know, everybody uses the same one. We argue which one's different, but it costs about $200 for a two inch filter. If you order one of these, to specification, a, a, a tuned interference filter. What's the cost? Yeah. Who? Uh, I mean, it, <laughs> and who makes them? Yeah. So we got this filter from a company called Aluxa. Um, it was very expensive. Uh, I thank God I have forgotten the exact number. It was far more than two hundred dollars. <laughs> If I remember correctly, it was like of order ten thousand. Uh, yeah. Is is extremely expensive these filters. Um, well, I mean, maybe in relation to the rest of work itself, it might be not as expensive. But um, I think the material that it's made out of has to be different, right? Work is cooled; it's like liquid nitrogen cooled. Uh. So the filter has to be made of few silica, so it has low uh, uh, low th thermal coefficient. Uh, and to get a bandwidth that's so narrow that it can cover this line um, and only this line, but then that blocks all of the other wavelengths that work is sensitive to, that also adds a, a lot onto the design requirement. Um, so there's, there's a lot of little considerations that, we ha that go into this that, that drive up the cost, but um, thanks to a really generous grant from the Heising Simons Foundation, we were able to, to purchase it and... Uh, show that the science is really viable. Neat. Thank you. Yeah. I think these narrow band filters are made by laying down layer after layer after layer of different coatings. Mm -hmm. And companies don't, they're not interested in doing that. I mean, it's just at a price that we amateurs can afford anyway. They just, yeah. they don't want that kind of business. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing to to both design and do like and you know there's also various things about the the material that you're depositing like the index of refraction of those materials like matters a fair bit um yeah. as well as the index of refraction of the of the substrate so uh, a lot of things go into it designing a new filter like this one takes a lot um but once there's like substantial interest it becomes i think a lot easier for them to make it once they have like a you know a set process which is why like Probably like an H alpha solar filter isn't that expensive right now, you know.
Other questions? Other questions? What else have we got? Okay, I see one in chat. Oh. Well, with that, Shreyas, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks thank for having you. me. Very well done. Thank you. Great thank talk. You. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions or you want to chat about any of this stuff, feel free to reach out. I'm always, always happy to chat by email and stuff. Uh, oh, okay. Great. And with that, if I could, next week, Reed Riddle, next week, sorry, two weeks from now, 26th, Reed Riddle will be talking about <clears throat> lasers and robots and how automation has changed Palomar Observatory and has greatly improved the productivity of Palomar Observatory. Um, Reed, uh, Reed did the ultraviolet laser Robo AO and he'll be talking about some of the other aspects of automation here at the observatory. Okay? It's in two weeks. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Steve. Everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks. Good to see everybody. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Great talk. Nice talk. Thank you.